questions if I can if I can help anyone at all uh, down the line. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, we have had just comments recently about uh, the size of the screen. Um, I think that rather than asking people to change fonts on their own machines, because it'll depend, if you want to be able to see it better, it's best to use the Zoom uh, window itself to, to increase the magnification, um, or you can access the scripts on the GitHub. So we're, we're able to have five minutes of questions for Kevin, if there are any, and, um, but Kevin does in the meantime, do you adjust the standard errors for the fact that the propensity scores are estimated rather than known when you're estimating your final treatment effects? And is that something easy to do or is that, a tri is that difficult? Could you repeat again, sorry? Uh, yeah, because you're estimating the propensity scores rather than knowing the true values, do you adjust the standard errors for the treatment effects that you estimate to account for this greater uncertainty? Okay, so, uh, so typically we, we don't do that. I think with um, with the use of stabilized weights, it, it helps that the so I believe that the variance estimate the estimation of variance is uh, becomes more standard. I think when you use uh, inverse probability of treatment weighting, the variance estimation is uh, less stable. I believe so it makes it harder to calculate things like standard errors. Using stabilized weights, we tend to 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 work with. Um, to work with what's produced because the sample size is preserved and those sort of things. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we've had a, a recommended or a note from Manuel Gomes, uh, one of the experts at using bootstraps. Uh, you, usually I use bootstraps because the analytic is just beyond my abilities. Or be fully Bayesian and you don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> Okay, Kevin, and um, we'll just uh, say thank you very much for a really interesting talk, uh, seeing all these methods implemented in R and how you do it all in one single script. And we do greatly appreciate that it's a single script, makes it much easier to run. Um, so if anyone has any further questions for Kevin, uh, please, you can put them in the chat and Kevin, I invite you to respond to them there as well if anyone's trying to run the code. But now we'll take a, a short uh, 15 minute break until 20 past two. And when we return, uh, we'll have a presentation by Josephine Walker on using R for cost effectiveness analysis of hepatitis C screening and treatment interventions in low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. Talk to you all soon. right now and Josephine I think I've given you co-host right so you should be able to share your screen and uh, unmute yourself yes. and everything and Thank just apologies you. Um, uh, for the title not being exactly correct Josephine <laughs> oh no I mean that was the title I put in a while ago and I've since updated um I'm just trying to find how I can share the correct um slides oh here it is Um, and make it full screen. Looks good now. Looks good? Great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm, I'm Josephine Walker. I work at the University of Bristol um, in the medical school and we I work in an infectious disease modeling group. My background is primarily in well in ecology and infectious disease modeling and I've come more recently to health economics because we're looking at cost effectiveness of, of new relatively recently available treatments for hepatitis C virus. So we use our infectious disease models within cost effectiveness analysis. Um, you should have the code um, that Howard shared. So in the presentation I will I've got snippets of the code here in the slides and at the end we can go through in RS everyone else has been doing if, if there's time um, and see see what you like. Okay, so um, 
just to introduce a bit of background about the subject, hepatitis C um, is a highly infectious bloodborne virus. So it's primarily widespread around the world, particularly in um, more higher income countries in people who inject drugs due to needle and syringe sharing and contact with blood products. But in some settings, um, it's also prevalent in the general population due to unsafe medical procedures or you know, um, non-sterile equipment used in dental or cosmetic treatments. So um, yes, in, in, in 2016, the World Health Organization set a target of eliminating hepatitis C by 2030 because in 20, around 2014, new curative drugs became available and that were quite expensive. <laughs> but prior to this, the only treatments for hep C were about 50 or 60% effective um, at curing it. And these drugs are more than 95% effective. So it was sort of seen as, okay, now this is actually something we can tackle. The new drugs have fewer side effects. And so we will go ahead and try to make treatment more widespread. Um, this has been quite difficult, particularly in lower income countries where the drugs which were developed um, by mostly initially by Western drug companies were put on list prices that were extremely high. And there's been a lot of negotiation and um, differences in licensing agreements to allow the drug prices to come down in countries that can't afford to pay the high prices, which were probably set in order to meet the uh, things that, like the nice threshold. <laughs> so uh, the cost of the drugs, for example, list price initially might would have been like $80,000 for a course of treatment. In the countries where we're working, such as Kenya, Pakistan, Cambodia, um, the, the, now you can get a course of treatment for closer to $100 to $200. So that's obviously a very big difference. Um, Anyway, that's just the background and context. In this figure, you can see that in people who inject drugs in particular, the prevalence is extremely high. So the, the, even the middle green, which is the most prominent where you can see in the US and Canada and Russia, for example, that is between 40 and 60% of people who inject drugs are infected with hepatitis C. Um, Yep, I just talked about this. In my research, I modeled the impact and cost effectiveness of hepatitis C treatment in a variety of settings. I named a few of them already. Um, and one of the, the really important thing and the reason that I'm talking about infectious disease modeling today is that for hepatitis C and for many other, most other infectious diseases, or for example, when you're looking at the vaccination programs, um, a large impact of the intervention um, is on what infections are averted. So you're curing people and that means they're not infecting new people. So if you were to use a Markov model um, or some other type of simulation model which assumes a constant rate of reinfection or doesn't account for reinfection, you're gonna really underestimate the impact and the, uh, the, the qualities saved because you're not accounting for what new infections aren't happening. So the type of transmission model here, instead of SIR, I should probably say ODE. So <laughs> um, SIR means sus uh, susceptible, infected, recovered, and ODE is ordinary differential equation. So we use an ODE model, um, which is deterministic, but it's dynamic. So that means that the number of new infections relates directly to the um, the number of people who are infected and the number of people that are still susceptible. And you've probably heard a lot about transmission modeling recently in terms of COVID. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, and yeah, so just jump right in. I've drawn a model diagram here. Um, I, I made a sort of quite simplified version of the models that we might look at. Um, and it looks like there's a lot of compartments here. There's 16 or so. Um, and this accounts for people who inject drugs and people who no longer inject drugs. So XP would, if they stop, um, 
stop using drugs, then they move into this no longer injecting drugs category. And that can happen whether they're susceptible, infected, um, move on to develop cirrhosis. So when you have hepatitis C over time, you develop cirrhosis and other liver diseases. Um, and there should be a line going like that um, between cirrhotic people who inject drugs and X. Um, anyway, so the susceptible people can become infected. They can get on treatment when they're in the baseline sort of early stages of infection, or if they move on to have cirrhosis, they can also be treated. They can be cured. 95% um, of patients will be cured and 5% will fail treatment and will go back into that initial category. And treatment can occur either in active injectors or in people who are no longer injecting. The, um, a big assumption that I've made here is that transmission only occurs in people who inject drugs. Normally, we would allow for a lower level of, of transmission um, in the general population and people who are no longer injecting. We, we have to assume that people who inject drugs leave injecting at a certain rate to become X. Um, those infected with hepatitis C develop cirrhosis over time, allow for a higher risk of death uh, for people who inject drugs. That could be due to overdose or other risky behaviors. Um, and those with cirrhosis. Uh, so when you have cirrhosis, you have a risk of death due to liver disease. Um, and if you're treated before you develop cirrhosis, you, you will no longer progress to develop cirrhosis. Um, and just to say that we allow for um, new people to come into the model, so new susceptible people who inject drugs do appear over time. So we're going to use this model to address a research question um, of what is the cost per quality gained of treating people who inject drugs for hepatitis C compared to not treating them, and then break that down into a few more interventions is it more cost effective to exclude people who are actively injecting drugs from treatment um, and only treat people who uh, are X injectors to treat people who inject drugs at the same rate as X injectors or at a higher rate? Um, so exploring those different elements can all be looked at with this type of model. And then I'm just gonna show a couple of examples for a time horizon of a hundred years or five years and um, discount by 3%. So um, a lot of my work is actually doing the, the costing part as well, going and collecting cost data. So far, I haven't really figured out how to do that fully in R because because the uh, it usually involves going through very long lists of expenditures um, and uh, those come to me in Excel. But anyway, the um, here I'm assuming the cost of treatment is $375. That's based on the work that we've done um, in Cambodia. And assuming that if you ha have cirrhosis that you require a healthcare cost of $200 per year. And then using um, weights for qualies that are different whether you're injecting or not. And this is based on, on literature and some previous models. Okay, so now I'm just going to come to the code if everyone's happy with that. Um, and just walk through basically how you implement this kind of model. So the, the library, the main library that is required to do um, a differential equation model is dsolve. And there's a particular syntax which you have to use to run the, the models and set them up. So First, you have to define the initial conditions for each of those compartments. So each box that I showed on the previous slide, I've just given a name. So SP is susceptible, people who inject drugs, IP, infected, TIP, on treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So in the initial conditions, I've assumed a population of 10,000 people who inject drugs and 4,000 of them are infected. That's based on this 40% prevalence, which is actually on the low end of what you might expect to see, but just to make the model run quicker. 
Um, so time points, um, you have to define what time points you want out. So here I've just said one to 100. Um, and then just coming back to this diagram to, to remind you, what we, what we have to do to code the model now is define all of these arrows. So what changes occur to each of these populations at each time step? Um, the differential equation solver solves the equations in, in continuous time, um, but it is, is helpful to, for me to refer back to this diagram to think when I'm writing the equations, um, okay, if you're susceptible, you can move to become infected or you can leave injecting. If you're infected, you could get on treatment. You could return to, to being infected because you failed treatment. You could enter from becoming infected, etc. So that's just the basics of what's coming up. So you have to define the model equations within this function. This is split over three slides um, and you can see the whole thing in the in the code file. Um, so the first thing is defining what it means to or how people become infected. And this is a function of um, the number of patients that are infected divided by the total population. So that's just been defined as lambda. And also we set births to be equal to the number of deaths um, that are not due to hepatitis C. So mu is the rate of death and we've set that equal to births. Just um, the more important thing I think is this slide. I've, I've put in the comments, um, as I mentioned, like what is happening in each of these. So DSP in the top left, that's what changes in the susceptible people who inject drugs group um, at each at each time step, essentially. So we have people entering, susceptible um, people coming back into the model. That's represented by B, as we put on the previous slide. People become infected at a rate of lambda, which we also defined on the previous slide. Um, uh, cessation, so that's moving to the, um, the X period, uh, category, I've defined that as tau, and then you can also, they could, they could be dying at a rate related to being people who inject drugs. So we do the same thing for each category, susceptible, infected, treatment, um, cirrhosis, and so basically just anything that comes out of here, um, lambda, sp, people who are becoming susceptible, they leave there with a minus and they go here um, into the infected category with a plus. Um, so that's everything basically that's put in here has to move into one of the other equations. Um, and then the same thing again for, these are now the equations for the um, X injectors, but it's essentially the same idea. You're either entering or leaving. Um, and these are all the changes you'd expect to occur. So this is the syntax that's needed for, for the desolve um, to run. And you then have to return this list of all of the changes that happened to each group. And the solver essentially runs it and fits all of the data over time to get the outputs. So just coming back, <laughs> the parameters that I mentioned. Um, so what we do to run the different scenarios, we can vary the parameters. In the baseline no treatment scenario, I've set treat, sorry, treatment equals zero, um, transmission rate, uh, the rate of leaving treatment, cure rate, death rates, etc. And we change the parameters to model different scenarios. So what I showed you there, treatment rate was zero. When we're gonna treat um, everyone equally, set the treatment rate to be 20% per year. That's um, fairly arbitrary. Um, or if we treat at a higher rate 
for people who inject drugs or not treat them. I've used this 